Let's pray. Holy God in heaven, holy and righteous is your name, Father. We come with bowed heads and thanksgiving in our heart, Father. Firstly, holy God, we just want to petition you that you forgive us of our sins. Father, we ask that you strengthen our spiritual knowledge, dear God, and our spiritual will, that we may uh, resist the wiles of the devil. Holy God, we're thankful for you giving us continuous opportunities to come here on this campus to learn more about your will and your way. Father God, I ask that you continue to impart your knowledge on our instructors, dear God, that they will I ask, Father, that you will continue to crown their head with your wisdom and knowledge, that they will uh, continue to impart those truths to us in a way that we can understand and apply to our daily lives. For my uh, fellow students, dear God, I just ask you uh, bless us with a continued zeal. Father, bless us that we'll see the studies that we have as vitally important to our spiritual health and growth. And dear God, as we close this prayer, we're just thankful, Father, for your continuous forgiveness, for your continuous long-suffering, dear God, for your patience, Holy Father. Dear God, we just ask you to continue to watch over our families and our friends. May your love be a protective hedge around them, dear God. All these blessings we ask be your will in your only son's name, in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Good morning, everyone. Um, The song we'll sing this morning is As the Deer. Uh, Will you sing with me? As the deer pants for the water, so my soul longs after you. You alone are my heart's desire, and I long to worship you. You alone are my strength, my shield.
Our reading is going to be found in John 21, verses 15 through 17. And I'll be reading out of the NASB 95. So it starts in 15. So when they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And he said to him, tend my lambs. He said to him again a second time, Simon, son John, do you love me? He said to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, Shepherd my sheep. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, Do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, You know all things. You know that I love you, Jesus said to him. Tend my sheep. When my wife and I were licensed for foster care a few years ago, the organization that licensed us was called Agape. You've probably heard of that organization. It has different chapters in different locations. And so we were licensed through Agape of North Alabama, based over in Huntsville. Why is it called Agape? Well, you probably know that is one of the Greek words for love. And maybe you think about that particular word, and probably the, the reason they named their organization this is because they think of the, that particular word along the lines of the way Wikipedia tells us to think about it. If you go to the Wikipedia article on agape, the very first line as of today is, in Christianity, agape is the highest form of love charity, and the love of God for man and of man for God. Now, I am going to talk to you uh, today about uh, Greek words for love, but I also want to illustrate how to use Wikipedia. I use Wikipedia all the time. I cite. When I use Wikipedia, I cite it. Uh, And partly the reason I do that is to let you know, if you want more information on this, go to Wikipedia. There's an article on that. I'm going to do that a little bit later. There's a book, and I'm going to say there's a Wikipedia article on that book. You can learn more about that book. But you use Wikipedia, the way you use Wikipedia, it's sort of like asking your dad for information on something. Your dad probably knows like information, a little bit of information on just everything. But he probably hadn't done any research on any of it, right? So he is giving you, he's giving you sort of the Time Magazine version. He's read Time Magazine, and he has some idea of the conflict in the Ukraine and what that, that's all about. And he has some idea on monetary policy and stuff like that. But you wouldn't want to cite that in a research paper. You would want actual, like, research to go into that. Wikipedia is, is sort of like that. You know, th- it is a great resource to get, what are people saying about this? That's why I went to Wikipedia for agape. I wanted, what are people saying about agape? And that first line is perfect. It gives me exactly what people say about agape. Wonderful. It's wrong. All right, if, but you would know that through doing actual research, but it gives me what I wanted from it. What do people say about this topic? People who know not absolutely nothing, but people who know a little something. What do they say about this topic? All right, uh, sometimes it does much better than that. Let me, let me give Wikipedia its uh, props here. I mean, sometimes it does so much better than that. So uh, it is sometimes just a wonderful resource for starting your research. I would say it's almost always that. It says again, In Christianity, agape is the highest form of love, 
charity, the love of God for man and of man for God. I don't want to say that's really wrong or like massively misleading. It's just a little bit misleading, I think. As James Barr says, now James Barr is the real deal, the late great James Barr. He says, um, agap- the problem is agape, the Greek word agape, in actual biblical Greek did not always signify agape, the English word agape. You see the distinction? There's a Greek word agape that we would really like to know what that means because it appears in the New Testament and it appears in the Old Testament as well in the Septuagint. But our English word agape has certain connotations that maybe the Greek word did not have. All right. Now, any book by C.S. Lewis is a book you ought to read. You ought to start with mere Christianity, then go to the screw tape letters. I'll forgive you if you start with the Chronicles of Narnia, but for goodness sake, read them in the publication order. All right. But another book you need to read by C.S. Lewis is called The Four Loves. It was published in 1960. That book has a Wikipedia page. You can also find some videos on YouTube where he is, C.S. Lewis, the actual C.S. Lewis, is giving radio addresses about the content of that book. So that's pretty cool. The book is an explanation of the different kinds of loving relationships that people have, a meditation on the concept of love itself. I wonder whether if you pressed him, of course he died in 1963, uh, I wonder if you pressed him, C.S., I wonder whether C.S. Lewis would say that uh, the loving relationships that people can have or, or the kinds of love that humans can express can actually be divided into more than just four or fewer than four, and whether he just picked four because that's what he found helpful for analyzing those different kinds of relationships. At any rate, he named his book The Four Loves, and he's got chapters on each of those four kinds of loves, and his chapter titles are Affection, Friendship, Eros, and Charity. Lewis related each of these to a Greek word. You've maybe heard about this, that there are four Greek words for love. Now, not all these Greek words actually appear in the New Testament, not all those four, but uh, only a couple of them do, actually. But here's the whole list as presented by Lewis. We start with affection, and he related that to the Greek word storge, which he said is like parents and children. That's sort of the basic way. Uh, He's got a 30-page chapter on it, so it's it's a lot more than just parents and kids, but that's a, a nice way to think about it as a basic way. This word does not appear uh, anywhere in early Christian literature, storge, which is sort of interesting, isn't it? But the verb, it, I can say that it doesn't appear anywhere in early Christian literature. What I mean by that, for those who know, it does not appear in BDAG. BDAG does not have an entry on storge. It does, BDAG, this is the um, most authoritative Greek lexicon for the New Testament and early Christian literature. The BDAG does have an entry on the verbal form. Storge is the noun. The verbal form is stergo, and that is found in BDAG, but it's not found in the New Testament. So we're talking apostolic fathers and later. Number two is friendship, and C.S. Lewis related that to philia. Of course, that appears a lot in early Christian literature. Number three is eros. Now, you will find the Greek word eros in BDAG, but not in the New Testament. You will also find the verbal form erao in BDAG, but not in the New Testament. Okay, this is the sort of the, usually it's related to the romantic love, falling in love, that kind of thing. Since those terms, as I already mentioned, do appear in BDAG, you know that, well, they're somewhere in early Christian literature, even if they don't appear in the New Testament. They're somewhere in early Christian literature. Otherwise, they would not appear in the lexicon, BDAG. 
And so, so if you look up some of those references, you'll see that falling in love, hmm, that might not always get the job done. It might not always be this sort of romantic kind of thing. I don't know. It's a little tricky, isn't it? I mean, you would say, I hope, uh, we ought to love God. Right? Would you also be willing to say we ought to be in love with God? I think some of you would be willing to say that, and some of you would be like, I don't know if that... I mean, certainly, if we were to say that, we ought to be in love with God, we would be borrowing the expression from the romance context and applying that to our spiritual relationship with God. And I suppose if we said we ought to be in love with God, what we would mean by that is... When we're in love with someone and that sort of, that expression gives us this idea of like, we're just completely invested in this other person and we get the flutters whenever we think about them and whenever we're around them and all that, we just, it's just this passionate, um, wonderful experience. And we ought to experience something or we ought to strive to experience something along those lines in our relationship with God as well. But I... None, I don't think any of us would be willing to say our relationship with God should be a romantic relationship. Right? That, doesn't, that doesn't get it done. But in love with God, maybe if you think about that in the right way. So already we're sort of problematizing what exactly is love and how do we, again, read C.S. Lewis's Four Love. It's good meditation on these ideas. So back to the word eros. Usually it is thought of as romance, but Justin Martyr in the second century in his dialogue with Trypho, chapter 8, section 1, said when he was introduced to Christianity, he said a fl- immediately a flame was kindled in my soul and a love, eros, a love of the prophets and of those men who are friends of Christ possessed me. That is, he, he, Justin is describing this almost like a kind of an in love experience that he's having, but maybe we should call it passion, zeal for the prophets and the quote unquote friends of Christ. I think he's talking about the apostles. The, uh, he's, he, he wants to read scripture. He just, he's all into it now. But he uses the Greek word eros. All right, and then the fourth one that Lewis talks about is he calls it charity, and of course it's related to agape. Now, listen, you ought to read Lewis's book as a meditation on the concept of love, but do not read it as an exposition on Greek linguistics. The general ideas, I think, are good and fine, helpful. The linguistic ideas that one might take away from it have problems. If you relate those particular Greek words to particular concepts, you're just going to be misled. Because those Greek words, as I've already tried to illustrate, don't always correspond to the concept that Lewis is talking about or that we sometimes talk about. What I'm saying is, eros is not always romance. Justin had eros for the scriptures. Agape is not always the highest form of love or God's love for man or man's love for God. That's not how the word agape is used. Uh, Philia is not always friendship. Sometimes it's something different from that. Moreover, you know, sometimes I think you'll hear Greek has four, you know, Greek is so much richer than English because it has these four words for love and English only has one word for love, which is, of course, ridiculous, ludicrous nonsense that English only has one word for love. Um, I mean, there are all kinds, uh, ardor, uh, uh, or you could adore someone, or you could cherish, or relish, or uh, there, there are all kinds of uh, be, have affection for words in English for love as well. So it's not the case that English is 
poor in these words in comparison to Greek. Now, when we think about words for love, and we think about the New Testament, we probably think about John 21. Eventually, we'll get to John 21 in our thinking anyway, but let's go ahead and read that passage again, and I'm going to read from the ESV. When they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, feed my lambs. He said to him a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, tend my sheep. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. All right, we've got two different Greek words at play. Probably most of you already know that. We've got agapao, which is the verb form of agape. We've got phileo, which is the verbal form of philia. Now, if we're going with uh, the C.S. Lewis breakdown here, we would have agapao, charity. We're not talking about giving money to people, though. That's not what charity is in C.S. Lewis's mind when he's writing that. He's doing the KJV charity thing, okay? And then we've got philia is friendship, okay? So we've got friendship versus like the highest form of love, All right? And so uh, we can, I'm just going to use the nouns in my retelling of it here, okay? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go back and forth between agape and philia, all right? So Jesus says, do you agape me? And Peter responds, yes, I philia you. Jesus says, do you agape me? Peter responds, yes, I philia you. Jesus says, do you philia me? Peter says, yes, I philia you. All right, so that's the interchange. We get agape twice. Jesus' first two questions, he uses agape. But all three times, Peter uses philia. And in the third instance, Jesus also uses philia. So the question often asked about this passage is, do the two different Greek words mean different things here? Now, if the two different Greek words mean different things, how are we supposed to understand this passage? And I think you've probably heard sermons on that, and perhaps you've preached sermons on that. And the upshot of this whole thing is don't preach sermons like that. But uh, if, if the two mean different things, how should we understand the passage? Well, it would be, I think this is the way the sermons usually go, is it would be something like Jesus is saying, do you, Peter, love me with the highest form of love? And Jesus says, yeah, you know, I mean, I want to be friends. No, no. Do you love me with the highest form of love? No. Well, you know, I I want to be friends with you, Jesus. Uh, Okay. Are you willing to be friends with me? Yeah, I'll be friends with you. And so Jesus sort of gives up and comes down to the level that Peter is willing to go and goes with that. Now, I might be misrepresenting these sermons that are preached on the two different ways of thinking about love, but that is my understanding of how that usually goes. Now, I am telling you, I don't think that is what the passage means, and I think uh, I'm going to present evidence to you that the two different words actually are simply synonymous in this passage. They are synonymous, and usually they are more or less synonymous. Now, I do not mean by that that the two words are always synonymous or that the meaning of philia completely overlaps with the meaning of agape. But largely they overlap. Largely they overlap. And in this passage, I think they're just used uh, synonymously. All right, so let's talk about the word agape. Is agape always the highest form of love? No. I mean, clearly, if you read your Bible very closely, agape is not always the highest form of love. It is the, the, the noun is not used very often in the Septuagint. It's used a few times. One of the times, in fact, the first time, if you're reading it from Genesis and you read through the Septuagint, the first time you will... 
encounter the noun agape is in 2 Samuel 13, verse 15. And Amnon hated her with a very great hatred, for the hatred with which he hated her was greater than the agape with which he had agaped her. You remember that context? Is that the highest form of love that Amnon had for Tamar in 2 Samuel 13? Is that like the divine love as, it, you know, this is the way God he loves the son. It, that's what Amnon had for Tamar. Well, if that's what you think, you better read that passage again because that's not what's going on in that passage. All right. So is agape always the highest form of love? Of course not. If you read the Bible closely, that is a ridiculous thing to think. Um, let's see, the noun agape appears 116 times in the New Testament. Um, the verb appears 143 times in the New Testament. Now, I, I will say this, um, man, time runs out. Um, but let's see, that uh, aga, agapao, the verb, the verb is used as early as Homer. All right, and it's used a bunch in Greek literature of all kinds and places, it's used a bunch. Agapao, the verb. Agape, not so. Agape is much later. It's not attested, I think it's not attested at all, until the Septuagint. And so the noun agape is just not very common in Greek literature until you hit really Christian literature. And so that has led people, that has played into this idea, well, agape must be this special kind of love I don't think that's right. Again, the verb is used all over the place for, you know, in Greek literature, Christian literature, non-Christian literature, and things like that. All right. Uh, but certainly the verb was not always uh, some exalted form of love. In the New Testament, the verb is used, John three nineteen. people loved the darkness more than the light. That's not exalted. 2 Timothy 4.10, Demas has abandoned me because he loved agape. He loved the present age. 2 Peter 2.15, he loved agape, the wages of unrighteousness. All right, so agape is not always the highest form of love. In fact, it is pretty clear that agape and philia oftentimes just completely overlapped. All right, uh, usually uh, in the Gospel of John, we read this phrase, the disciple whom Jesus loved. Usually the word loved there is the word agape or agapao. One time, John 20 verse 2, it's the word phileo, philia. Is that a different kind of love, the disciple whom Jesus loved? Usually he loved him with the highest form of love, but one time he just loved him with a friendship kind of love. Well, that's silly. They just mean the same thing. Uh, the father loves the son. Oftentimes that is using agape. John 5.20 uses phileo. The father loves the son with a phileo kind of love. That is God loves Jesus is what we're talking about here. Is that a friendship kind of thing? Is that a lower form? Oh, no, that's not that. Uh, Matthew 23 verse 6. Listen to this. They love to have the place of honor at banquets and the best seats in the synagogues. Okay, you got the context in your head. That's Matthew 23, verse 6. The word love is phileo. Now listen to uh, Luke 11, verse 43. Woe to you Pharisees, you love the best seat in the synagogues and greetings in the marketplaces. Sound like a very similar context, but the word is agape. Matthew 23, verse 6, it's philia. 11, Luke eleven forty three. it's agape. It's the same thing. Moving on, back to, uh, we, we could look at other examples of this where agape and philia are just very similar. The meanings overlap very, very closely. But getting back to John 21, notice that there are other variations. I tried to point them out in my reading, but notice that there are other variations besides just the Greek words for love. So the, there are variations in lambs versus sheep. And there are variations in feed versus tend. I'm, I'm talking about the, what Jesus tells Peter. Remember, feed my lambs. 
Well, he actually, vary, Jesus varies up those expressions all three times. None of the three expressions are the same. The ESV tries to bring this out in their English translation. It is a variation that exists in the Greek. So according to the ESV, the way they translate it is, number one, feed my lambs. Number two, tend my sheep. Number three, feed my sheep. All right, so there's variation there as well indicating to me that it's just a passage with varying terminology. It all means sort of the same thing. I think you would be hard-pressed to make a distinction between feed and tend. When I say feed, I'm talking about this kind of activity, and when I say tend, I'm talking about something else. Nah, it's, it's just synonymous, lambs and sheep. Notice also the narrator's comment in verse 17 Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, do you love me? Do you philia me? According to the narrator, Jesus has asked three times, do you philia me? Do you get the implications there? The narrator does not think philia is different from agape because actually Jesus said agape, agape, philia. But the narrator says the third time, you know, three times he's asked now, do you philia me? So the narrator seems to think the Greek words are the same. I think it's similar to our word for faith. We have a a synonym with the word faith in English. It's the word belief, right? Now we we have a verb that goes along with belief. That verb is believe. We don't have a verb that goes along with faith, though. You don't, you know, faith, you put your faith in something or you have faith in something. But belief and faith are very similar. I mean, do you distinguish between those two words? It's difficult. It's difficult. And if you do distinguish between those words, you've, you've got to explain it because not everybody would share your distinction, right? Belief and faith. So let me illustrate. I think this is a good way of thinking about this passage. Let's change the concept from love to faith. Jesus says, do you have faith in me? And Peter says, yes, I believe in you. Jesus says, do you have faith in me? Peter says, yes, I believe in you. Peter was bothered that he asked the third time whether he believed in him. So Jesus says again, do you believe in me? And Peter says, yes, I believe in you. I think if if it were worded in that way, we would... We wouldn't think at all that there's any sort of distinction. In It's just three times he's asking him this same question, not distinguishing between the words. Mm. Time. Well, I think there is, I'm not going to tell you what it is, but I, because you want to get to lunch, but I think there is a reason, perhaps, that uh, there is a distinction here, and it is probably echoing the Septuagint of Proverbs 8, verse 17. All right, the distinction between agape and philia, or it might be. I'll say that's a good suggestion, that it's echoing the Septuagint of Proverbs 8, verse 17, where the two different words appear. But coming to the end, what is the lesson? What is the takeaway, as Maui would say? Uh, study doesn't always give you what you were expecting. Right? I think it is still valuable to study Greek and to know about these Greek terms and to think about the Greek terms in all of the New Testament and the Septuagint as well. But it's not the case that once you get done with that study in this instance that you have, I think, some deeper idea of what the word love means or you're able to see a distinction that is unavailable to people who are just reading English. Because at the end of the study, I think if you're doing the study very well, you'll come to the conclusion that, well, the English translation sort of, they get it right. So the study doesn't always give you what you want, but still the study is valuable because you have a whole lot more information in your head about why that English translation is good to go. And then I think another lesson is there's a lot that's just on the surface of the text that you don't really have to dig down deep it's just right there 
And maybe we want to dig down deep because we would like it to be something different or some new insight or something else. But the fact is, Jesus says, love. And the problem is, we know exactly what that means and what that requires of us. And it's not something we really have to study Greek to figure out. It requires, as Jesus tells Peter, action on your part. If you're to really be one who loves Jesus and loves your fellow man. The problem for us is it's pretty obvious what that means. Thank you. If you would, bow with me. Our dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this day that you've blessed us with. Uh, we thank you for Dr. Ed and the lesson that he presented us. We pray, Father, that as this semester winds down, that you would be with uh, both the employees and students of Heritage, that we would be able to get everything done in due time. Uh, we ask, Father, that you would forgive us of our many sins help us to lean on your word in times of temptation. We pray, Father, that we would love you and not just say that we love you, but that we would show it in the way that we live and act. We pray that you would bless this food that we're about to partake of and bless the one that made it. We thank you so much, Father, for your son, Jesus, who came to this earth and died for us on the cross at Calvary. And it's in his name we pray. Amen.